It's the evening of February 16, 2020, Sunday. Melissa and her husband Tyler Schuth are out doing errands in Kakana, Wisconsin with Melissa's children, 5-year-old William Byer and 3-year-old Danielle Byer. The children had picked out a toy in a movie at Walmart and the family had dinner at Subway before heading home, which was in the upper portion of a duplex at 1201 Half Crooks Avenue. Danielle was sleepy, so she was carried from the car straight to bed, while William stayed up to watch the movie his parents bought him. At around 9.30pm, with the movie still playing, Melissa told William that he had to go to bed, but that he could finish the film in the morning. Both Melissa and Tyler give the youngster a kiss and a good night before tucking him in. Melissa and Tyler then head to bed. The next morning, at around 7am, Melissa and Tyler get up, stretch out, and prepare themselves for another Monday. In her grogginess, Melissa goes to prepare her children for the day. She walks into the children's room. Moments later. Out of game 911, what is the address of your emergency? I need an ambulance to 1201 and a half, Chris Davin, My wife just walked into our room and our son's face is covered with blood and he's not breathing and we're not sure what's going on. Okay, hold on while we get the help going. And you said you don't know if he's breathing? What? Hello, kids? Oh my god, please get here. We're getting help coming. You need to tell me what's going on, sir. I, I, here, here. Talk to her. Tell her what's going on. Oh my god, they're blowing it right here. I'm going. I don't know what I'm Ma'am, ma'am, take a breath. I need you to talk so I can understand you. I woke up and I want to get check on my kids. They're both laying in their bed bleeding. Okay, you know uh, okay, take a breath. We're going to ask you some questions while the help is coming. Are the children breathing? No. They're not breathing? No. Okay, hang on. We're getting some help coming. <laughs> How old are the children? Five and three. A five-year-old and a three-year-old? Yes. You need to take a breath and try and answer my questions. The help is coming, okay? We're going to tell you how to do CPR. I want you to go in the no, room. Ma'am, they can't. There's chunks like out of my son's neck. There's what? I can't do CPR. They've been dead for a while. I think they're dead. On. I, I can't. Take a breath. Like I said, the help is coming. I need you to check if you can. CPR could help. There's no pulse. I want you to place each child on the floor so we can do CPR. They need to be on a flat surface. <laughs> Are you able to do that? Okay, sorry, I can't understand you. I'm There's a big hole in my son's neck. There's a hole in your son's neck? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. And what about the other what about the other child? Yes. Okay. Okay, the ma'am, take 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 a breath. Take a breath. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. Has the help gotten there yet? No, I heard the, yes, I just see the, the police officer in front of the house. Okay, the officer's in front of the house. Go let him in. When officers from the Kakana Police Department arrived, they found a hysterical and hyperventilating Melissa at the top of the stairs. She directed the officers to the children's room, where they saw 39-pound William laying on the floor in between two beds, a full and a twin, and 33-pound Danielle laying on the twin partially covered with blankets. William had bloodstains on his face and hair and had blood covering the majority of his upper body. He had two overlapping stab wounds to the left side of his neck and two stab wounds to his right upper neck. His left carotid artery and left jugular vein had been severed. He also had wounds to his tongue, the right corner of his mouth and lower lip, and a deep wound to his thumb, a sign that he had woken up and tried fighting the attacker. 
Danielle was on the twin mattress wrapped up in a pink comforter and laying on her left side with her head and hair covered in blood with her feet dangling off the side of the bed. The mattress and pillow were covered in blood stains. Danielle had suffered a total of five stab wounds to the right side of her neck with her carotid arteries and jugular veins severed. Officers said they did not see evidence of forced entry into the home. At one point, Melissa said she had been on her hands and knees and looked at an officer and said, This is a nightmare, right? I'm going to wake up. William was born on May 23, 2014. The kindergartner was described as smart and inquisitive with a love of reading and a knack for building things with Legos. His favorite time of the year was Christmas, and he would flex his ability to decorate trees and sing carols. He loved superheroes and Jurassic Park. Danielle was born on March 23, 2016. She was described as a daredevil because she was curious and unafraid. She loved outdoor activities, including riding her bike and scooter, and was looking forward to starting school so she could go with William. Will was Danny's protector, and Danny always looked up to Will, said an obituary for the children. They were both always smiling with their great big smiles and were just happy to always be together. They shared a love for their stuffed animals and a bond with each other that was extremely tight. Our little angels, Will and Danny, may you rest together peacefully until we meet you again. Melissa told police that she had William and Danielle with her ex-boyfriend, 35-year-old Matthew Byer, and that Tyler was just their stepfather. It turns out that Melissa and Tyler married the month before Matthew and his new wife Erica married in 2019. And they did not get along. Erica, look. Look at me right in my face, Detective Stone of the Manitowoc Police Department told Erica Byer that Monday morning. I'm not lying to you. They did not tell me what happened. 30-year-old Erica had been in disbelief. At first, she had no idea why she was brought in for questioning at the police department. She had been pestering the detective to tell her what was going on. At around 6.15 a.m. that morning, roughly an hour before the 911 call, Erica got up and prepared her children for school. She left the home at 411 North 10th Street in Manitowoc and drove to Wilson Middle School, where she dropped off her daughter. At around 8 a.m., she took her son to a walk-in clinic for a sleep apnea appointment at an Aurora Medical Center on Garfield Street in Two Rivers. They then left the clinic at around 8.30 a.m. and stopped by their home to grab yogurt and baby food before they went to her sister Amy's house. She wasn't able to take her son to school afterward because when she parked in Amy's driveway, three police cruisers boxed her in and told her she was being detained. They are investigating the deaths of two children in Kagana, Detective Stone told Erica in the interview room. They may be Matt's kids, so they want to know where Matt is. Erica conveyed a sense of disbelief. She told the detectives in the room that she wanted a phone call to her husband. My husband has nothing to do with that, she said. I swear to God, he's been home all week. To which Detective Stone told her that nobody said he had anything to do with it. Throughout the interview, between repeated, oh my gods, and they were just kids, Erica had her suspicions as to who did it. She regretted that she and Matthew sent the kids back to Melissa and Tyler when they had them. Their mom. It's their mom. And I knew something was wrong with that girl from the get-go, Erica said. My husband is going to have a meltdown. By that point, Erica said the couple hadn't seen the kids in three weeks. They had visitation rights to the kids every other weekend. Erica said she got up at 4 a.m. the day before to her nine-month-old daughter crying from an illness. She stayed up with her until her 12-year-old woke up half an hour later. She said when she got up, her husband was sleeping. She made breakfast at around 7 or 7.45 a.m., then she played some Call of Duty with the kids for about an hour and then drove to pick and save grocery store at around 2 p.m. to get some food. She then went to get fuel for the car and went to a family dollar before returning home to make lunch and do the laundry in the building. She said everyone was at home when she returned, including Matthew, who was in the workshop making an outlet protector because her daughter kept playing with it. At around 6.30 p.m., the family made a pot roast for dinner. They then watched some movies until the kids were put to bed at around 7.30 p.m., Erica and Matthew then continued watching TV for a couple more hours until around 11 to 11.30 p.m. when Erica went to bed. She said Matthew took a Seroquel but couldn't sleep, so he ended up watching TV until he went to do his 5 to 3 p.m. work shift at the Crescent Woolen Mills Company in Two Rivers, at which the 35-year-old was a machine operator. Erica, who said she was having trouble sleeping, got up at 4 a.m. this morning and didn't see Matthew, but that was because he went to put fuel in his car and air in his tires. She said she knew this because he texted her that. 
It was only a couple of hours later that she was pulled into the interview room of the police station. Erica said she was sure it was Melissa, in part because she allegedly had a habit of angry texting her via several messaging apps. That was until the police told her to just block her after Erica got upset with Melissa about an alleged incident in which Melissa blew weed smoke in William's face, and William told Erica and Matthew that it made him feel funny. But Erica would later lean more toward Melissa's husband Tyler as a culprit because he had serious anger issues. On February 1, 2020, Matthew pulled up to the Quick Trip in Brilliant in his silver Chrysler town and country for the last exchange before the children's murder. Erica alleged that during that meet, Tyler got up in Matthew's face and started cursing at him about the use of the children's car seats. Matthew didn't want Melissa and Tyler to use them. Whether it was on mobile or in person, the two couples were constantly at each other's throats. Matthew had been at work that Monday morning when he got a call from Amy that his wife had been detained. Matthew arrived at Amy's place to talk to her. When he got back in the car and attempted to back out of the driveway, he was boxed in by squad cars and detained. He was brought into the same police station where Erica's questioning had already begun. Matthew told detectives that he was at home all night on Sunday and Monday, which was what Erica told them. He said he took some medication, perhaps a reference to the Seroquel, around 7pm but still couldn't sleep. He said he stayed up all night and passed the time by rolling cigarettes and playing on his phone. Then he said he stepped out to the Quick Trip at 401 North 8th Street in Manitowoc at 4.45am before going to work in Two Rivers. He claimed that he had not traveled to Kakana since December 2019, the same month he and Melissa had a court hearing about visitation. Surveillance footage showed he had, indeed, been at the Quick Trip getting $20 worth of fuel and putting air in his tires, which aligns with Erica's version. Matthew's employer also supplied records showing he punched in at around 5 a.m. When he was brought in, detectives observed that his clothes were dirty and he had grease and visible cuts to his hands and a scratch on his forearm, all of which came from work, he said. His story appeared to check out. Before he was let go, however, he was put in the same room as Erica. We should have never even sent them back, Erica told Matthew about the kids. I should have never started taking them again, Matthew responded. No, Erica said. You should have never sent them back when we had them. We should have kept them. I can't believe this shit's going on. I can't either, Matthew responded. What the hell? Who the hell could do that to a kid? I just have that gut feeling it's Tyler, Erica said. Why did they do it? Erica asked. Try to get us to go to prison, Matthew responded, alluding to a frame job. During the back and forth, which included consistent assurances that they didn't do anything, Matthew raised the possibility that it could be Melissa's downstairs neighbor. Erica responded by saying that it has to be Tyler or Melissa and that maybe they got into a fight, to which Matthew agreed, saying he might have taken it out on the kids when Melissa was at work. Erica had already alleged to detectives that Tyler and Melissa had discussed divorce and raised the possibility that a house fire months ago that forced Melissa to move from Lakewood to Kakana could be tied to the crime suggesting whoever started that fire may have been trying to burn the kids. They brought up Melissa's alleged drug habit, saying the kids could have been involved in the crossfire of a drug deal. Since she does drugs, she lies, cheats, and steals. Maybe she crossed the wrong person. I don't know. I don't know what the F she does, Matthew said. Both added that all Melissa allegedly cared about was the child support he was paying her. They raised her alleged violent streak, where she once allegedly broke Matthew's rib and tried breaking his leg. They both eventually agreed that it was unlikely to be Melissa because they didn't believe she had it in her. They instead focused on Tyler because of his alleged anger issues and the fact that, simply, the kids were not his. They alleged the kids would come to their home with bruises because they claimed they didn't listen to Tyler. Matthew and Erica said they tried getting help from Child Protective Services, but they allegedly did nothing about it. Erica also alleged that she saw William and Danielle touching each other, which made her suspect that Tyler was sexually assaulting them. They also agreed that it was suspicious that Melissa did not immediately tell them about the children's deaths. Whoever did it is going to prison for a very long time, Erica said. They were probably scared. I can only imagine, Matthew responded. They were probably scared and effing throwing names under the bus. He added he was concerned about the police's DNA swab of the cars because he forgot to tell them that he handled the kids' car seats. Erica then said they'll be okay because the police will look at their car's GPS and see that they didn't go anywhere. To which Matthew said, I didn't even know my vehicle had GPS. 
adding, in that case, it could be hacked. Erica responded, only cops can do that, and that he was being paranoid for no reason. A neighbor of Melissa's told police that three days before the killings at approximately 3 a.m. on Friday, he saw an early 2000s silver Chrysler Town & Country minivan park on Main Avenue and 12th Street in Kakana, which was about a block from Melissa's home. The neighbor said he observed the man exit the van, walk toward Melissa's home, and then walk around the block. The man, which the neighbor said was roughly six feet tall and skinny with dark clothing and a stocking cap, then left the area. Kakana police then reviewed home surveillance video from that Friday from a resident on Fieldcrest Drive, which showed the described silver minivan traveling eastbound to Henry Street and crossing over Fieldcrest Drive. Meanwhile, the Manitowoc Police Department reviewed traffic camera footage for that same Friday. They observed the described silver minivan backing out of the driveway at 411 North 10th Street in Manitowoc at approximately 2.19 a.m. and then that same van returning to the driveway at 4.23 a.m. Then, surveillance footage viewed on the morning of the 911 call showed the same minivan traveling to Kakana toward Melissa's home at around 1 a.m. It is then seen traveling away from the home at 3.10 a.m. toward Manitowoc. Traffic cameras further showed the minivan avoid all major intersections and main roads in Kakana on its way out of the city. It was clear that the police had good surveillance footage, but no suspect DNA at the scene or murder weapon. On June 4, 2020, months after the murders that had left the police thus far with no arrest, Matthew came to the police station to pick up some items that were in his van, which had been seized by police as part of its investigation. When detectives asked if he had any questions about the case, he said no. They found that odd because normally parents of murdered children would be eager to know the status of the case, so they brought him in for another round of questioning, this time armed with new evidence. Slowly, investigators were able to chip away at Matthew's story, which was, up to that point, a series of explanations as to how his van ended up near Melissa's home. At one point, he said it could have been his brother trying to frame him, or he could have been sleep driving. He then admitted to being in Kakana several times in the days preceding the murders, but not between Thursday, February 13, and Monday, February 17. He finally started to peel back some of that veneer. Matthew told detectives that he couldn't sleep on Friday night because he had a bad feeling and was anxious and fearful for his kids in Melissa's and Tyler's custody. He said he got in his car and drove to Kakana, parked near 14th Street, and got out of his car and started to walk around the block. He then walked toward Melissa's home to get what he said was a better feeling. He said he never entered the property. The next day, he went to bed at around 8pm with the same bad feeling. He said he woke up at around 1am and drove the same route to Kakana, Highway 10 to Highway 114. He parked his van on 12th Street across Melissa's driveway and walked around the block, but didn't go onto the property because that's breaking and entering, he said. However, under pressure of evidence, including surveillance footage, he eventually admitted to breaking into Melissa's home using a blue library card and creeping into the children's room to check up on them. He said he saw them sleeping peacefully and let them be. He said he also went there to find Melissa's drugs. But detectives weren't buying his story. The guy who told Erica that he never hit anybody with intent to hurt was formally arrested and charged with the murder of his children. To the detective's surprise, his reaction was muted, to say the least. There's 414 who are under arrest outside your two children. Okay. Six days later, on June 10, 2020, a detective was interviewing a friend of Erica's, Melissa Winnie, about interactions with Matthew and Erica. Melissa said it was sometime after the murders when they were sitting in the couple's living room when the conversation turned to the murders and who would commit such a crime. The discussion turned to how each of them would have done the deed. Matthew's version stuck out. Melissa alleged he said he would have used a screwdriver through the side of the neck to puncture the larynx, or he would use a pocket knife to cut their throats so they could not scream out to alert somebody. Erica similarly alleged that Matthew talked about killing Danielle first because she had a loud voice. She testified that she didn't tell police about Matthew's depictions of how he would hypothetically kill the kids because she didn't think he would do it. 
But she later grew suspicious that Matthew was the killer in part because, despite months of not arresting a suspect, Matthew didn't ask for updates on the case. Strange still was the fact he didn't attend the children's funeral. During the initial conversation with Matthew in the interview room on the day of the murders, Erica told him that she didn't want William and Danielle in her car because of stupid accusations. She apparently was alluding to a possible frame job by Melissa when she initially thought it was her who was involved in the killing. They had suspicions that Melissa was trying to break up their marriage so she could reunite with Matthew. Melissa and Matthew had been together for about seven years, but were never married prior to the acrimonious breakup. The pair had gone to court in 2016 to have declared that William and Danielle were the pair's own children. The pair had foregone legal representation, declined genetic tests that would have definitively established paternity, and waived any right to claim later that they did not have intercourse with each other around the time with which the children would have been conceived. The stipulation was that no such DNA tests could be ordered in the future. Matthew at the time agreed to pay child support on his roughly $3,100 per month salary working at what was then known as Xpera Specialty, a paper company. Meanwhile, while Melissa began dating Tyler in 2017, Matthew was still living with a pair and his children in the same home for about three months before marrying Erica, with which he had a child. Erica had known Matthew for years. The circumstances of their knowing each other was, in Erica's words, weird. Her oldest daughter was adopted by Matthew's brother. Erica and Matthew had started dating around June 2017. It was that year when they got a court order to get visitation of William and Danielle. There would be subsequent court dates set up to adjudicate further custody matters. But prior to the horrific news that Monday morning brought, he and Erica were in a seemingly endless cycle of fights about finances, allegations of affairs, and support for the children. This is an editorial note to say that if you are listening and not watching, you may want to turn your attention to the screen as there will be text messages displayed that will not be read. According to my review of 2,500 text messages between September 2018 and May 2019, Erica and Matthew had fought over various matters almost round the clock. The two had at several points threatened divorce against each other over Erica's allegations that Matthew was cheating on her because he was ignoring her texts. Erica was pregnant with her child when she had accused him of having an affair with Melissa when he went out to her home to see his children, even though the agreement was that a children's exchange would happen halfway between their homes. The pair also had several arguments over finances and were on the state equivalent of food stamps because Matthew wasn't working at the time. Matthew said he had a previous felony charge for drug possession, but it's not clear if that was the reason for his inability to work. Perhaps more importantly, Erica raised issues of supporting Matthew's kids according to the tax record. She complained about a lack of money and how they could be homeless with three children. She threatened putting their child up for adoption. She complained about having no time to watch his children, admitted to having to force feed the children so that Melissa wouldn't have a reason to call the authorities on them, and several times complained about how the kids looked like Melissa, who she hated. She even complained that William could be autistic and that he could end up killing animals and people if he's not treated. According to the complaint, which cites family court records, Erica was not to be left alone with William and Danielle. It appeared that the children were more of a liability for the cash-strapped couple, both in the fact that they had to pay out of their tight budget to support them and that they had to care for them at all in some cases. On several occasions, there was talk about harsh discipline to get the children in line, how they couldn't wait for Melissa to take them back, and even uncertainty about whether William was Matthew's child. In fact, Erica said that Matthew should check to see if he can do a paternity test for the children, even though he had already signed that court waiver that said he wouldn't seek one in the future. The gist of the story, if only taken from the records available, is that Matthew started to feel the pressure of a bad money situation, conflict at home and with Melissa and Tyler, paying child support for children Erica had issues with, who he wasn't so sure were his anymore, and that he was only seeing for six hours a week, and an emasculating existence in the form of Tyler's confrontational attitude toward him, and his kids calling Tyler daddy. The court would hear from Melissa that on that weekend before the children were murdered, Matthew did not show up to pick up the kids. Teachers testified in court that Matthew was also uninvolved in the kids' schooling, 
Others testified Melissa and Tyler had a good relationship with William and Danielle. It's no wonder why they call Tyler dad sometimes, the prosecutor in the case argued. Because to a kid, a dad is the person who is there every day, on the ins and the outs, the hard and good days, the fun times and the bad times. That's a dad. That was Tyler. That's who they saw. Because their biological dad, he didn't show. They drive to Brilliant thinking they were going to see him, and he wouldn't even show up. That's what happened on the 15th, two days before he killed them. That all led up to the fact that, later on the day William and Danielle were murdered, Melissa and Matthew had a custody hearing at court, which would have determined whether Melissa and Erica would get to have the children overnight, or possibly give Melissa sole custody. Matthew's defense team tried to say it could have been someone else, a jilted lover of Melissa's who sought revenge because she didn't love him back. But that person's alibi checked out. The circumstances and evidence, including surveillance footage and Matthew's admission that he was in the home that night, clearly pointed to Matthew. In fact, beside being suspicious that he hadn't asked for an update on the case, Erica said she had been having trouble sleeping because she recalled that on the day after the murders, she saw Matthew holding blood-stained khaki pants that he later took to work with him. In the weeks after the murder, she testified that she tried looking for the pants. She didn't tell investigators about the pants until after Matthew was arrested in June 2020 because she said she was scared for her children's safety. She also said there were knives from his collection that went missing after the murders. After Matthew's arrest, Erica said she received a letter from him asking her to buy a matching gray knife, khaki pants, and a shirt to take them to the police and say she found them in a car. But Erica instead told police about the letter. Matthew was ultimately convicted of the murder of his two children in less than an hour of jury deliberations, with the judge handing him a sentence of life without parole in December 2022. The murder weapon was never found, neither was Matthew's DNA in Melissa's home. Experts testified that a brush of his hand across a blanket in an attack would not necessarily leave DNA. The jury ultimately determined that Matthew didn't want to pay child support for children. He started to think, weren't his. Melissa testified in court that finding the children dead that morning was the worst imaginable thing possible. Tyler said he had problems with anxiety since the deaths of his stepchildren, which are heightened whenever he sees children of that age. On June 7, 2020, a couple of days after his arrest, Matthew teamed up with his cellmate to try to break out of jail. It went about as well as you can imagine. He was sentenced to five years for the attempt and for taking a guard hostage. As for Erica... She's moved on. She filed for divorce from Matthew in October 2020. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story, which is based largely on the primary sources, but with assistance from the secondary sources, including wbay.com, wmtv15news.com, and the Appleton Post Crescent. Special thanks to you guys for watching, engaging in the subject matter, and for liking the video, which helps generate revenue to pay for the primary sources that drive the narrative of these stories. This is the last video of the year. I really appreciate you all for congregating in the comments and making things interesting, informative, and overall enjoyable. Enjoy the holidays, and I'll see you all in the new year. Oh, and uh, don't be Matthew Beyer.